Hello everybody, it's Lori White from the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce and welcome to episode number 70 of Chamber TV. We are live uh, most days and we are talking with folks from the business community uh, that have timely stories to share, that have great information to share, and um, thoughts and ideas about where we are in today's economic environment and how we can use this time during the pandemic to research new ways of doing business and find new places where we can all connect and be a resource for one another. So we are very excited today to welcome Rebecca Weber. And Rebecca is the general manager of the Cambridge Innovation Center Providence, otherwise known as CIC. So, hey, Rebecca, how are you doing today? Lori, thank you so much for having me. I miss seeing you in person. I miss seeing you as well. And uh, we've spent so much time together over on Dyer Street in your beautiful new headquarters. And uh, I really miss the, the friendly surroundings and the co-working space and all the great clients that you have uh, at CIC Providence. So maybe we can spend a few minutes today just talking a little bit about what CIC is and the like. But first, we always uh, start our interviews by just uh, briefly saying, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How's your family? and uh, how are you spending these uh, difficult days? Thank you for asking that too, Lori. It's so important to check in because I think I'm increasingly understanding how much our external circumstances are starting to impact not just what happens inside 225 Dyer, but also what's happening for our colleagues, what's happening for our clients, and what's happening for the broader community. So I'm really grateful to report that my family is staying well um, I'm also grateful to report that there's been just stretches of sunshine that have given me plenty of chances to take advantage of outdoor activities. But I think the thing that I'm missing the most is the opportunity to engage with the growing community that we have here at 225 Dyer, especially in the CIC space, and then stitching together the excitement of that community with what's going on in the broader environment. I'm seeing so many changes around the city, Lori. I don't know if you've been down on Dyer Street recently, but the new Aloft Hotel is making incredible strides. It's already six stories high. And the new installations to support the bus rapid transit system are also nearly finished. So we see so much promise and I can't wait to actually engage with that potential again. So tell us where the Aloft Hotel is for those of our listeners and viewers who may not be incredibly familiar with the geography of that area? Sure. For context, I'm sitting here at 225 Dyer Street in what was previously called the Jewelry District, but is now broadly known as the Innovation and Design District. And I think we used to be where 195 was in Rhode Island Convention. Now I think we're on the other side of the pedestrian bridge. I think that's how it's transitioned, right, Lori, for everyone who's been spending Absolutely. time outdoors, Absolutely. especially downtown. So this building, 225 Dyer Street, was originally conceived of as one in a series or a campus that would be inclusive of three big corporate structures, whether they be a commercial office space or some ground level retail or some uh, lab space, as well as a hotel to support the circulation of individuals through um, this district. So 225 Dyer is the first commercial building and CIC occupies two and a half floors or about 60,000 square feet of this building. And the hotel is immediately north of us on the same block on Dyer Street. And it's really helping us visually connect into downtown, which I think is cementing the broader understanding that the Jewelry District or the Innovation and Design District is an extension of downtown. And it's a place where people are doing business with an eye toward the future. Well, another uh, local landmark that people might be familiar with is uh, right around Dayball Square. So you are just a stone's throw from there and also um, the University of Rhode Island Nursing School, which is also another beautiful landmark, new landmark on the scene. And we've been there together many times, Rebecca. So you're all in good company there with one another. That's a great reference point, Lori. And historically, the Jewelry District is something that you know is personally very close to my heart. My dad was in the costume jewelry industry for more than 30 years. So I spent many a childhood afternoon at Dave All Square for the jewelry show. And it feels so empowering for me to be part of this new economic resilience in an area that so defined the industrial heritage of Rhode Island. 
that's a great way to, to remember it. I, when I was a little girl, my dad uh, also uh, took me downtown and we used to go to the post office. So we used to go by the Dave All rubber factory and okay. all those Byzantine roads there. But I remember it incredibly vividly even before it was Dave All Square when it was Dave All Rubber, wow. uh, hence the name. So uh, a great, uh, one of the great industrial wonders of the world in that area. So it's great that the innovation district is able to play such a prominent role and uh, be such an attraction to entrepreneurs, startup professionals, uh, innovators of any stripe who want to experiment with doing business here and engaging in the community and connecting with um, fellow like-minded individuals. So tell us a little bit about what happens when you walk in through the revolving door at two. 25 Dyer Street or 255. 255. 255. You got it. Really. 225. Okay. Yeah. Tell us us what happens when you walk in the door. What's the ambiance? And um, let's act as though I am a potential uh, tenant at CIC. Oh, excellent. So, how can um, you delight me with what you have to offer? My favorite. I won't bore you with the entirety of the sales pitch, Lori. Unfortunately, I have colleagues who do a far better job than I do. But when you first walk through the door at 225 Dyer Street from that north entrance, you're going to be greeted by our concierge because CIC Providence has a concierge during business hours to help you as a client of CIC Providence welcome your guest, just like in any other office environment. You will also more recently be greeted by the opportunity, if you've not already done so, to conduct your health screening. We require a health screening for every visitor to the building to confirm your temperature and any symptoms you may be encountering, and to remind you about some of our new protocol like mask wearing in our public and common spaces. And we also have security at the ground level of our building, which is there 24 seven, because as you know, Laurie, innovative business activity doesn't stop. We have clients who are here at really peculiar hours, working really, really hard on some really exciting projects. So as you make your way through the building, you can make the choice to either enter District Hall, which is the free and public access point for co-working. It's the opportunity to drop into a library-like setting and to have access to a desk, a place to take a phone call, a place to take an informal meeting, a place to get some work done. We envision the ideas coming out of District Hall, maybe migrating up one floor to the events that happen on Thursday nights traditionally and are now virtual um, at Venture Cafe, which is the the default destination, I think, for some of the most exciting programming in and around Providence's business activity. And then from those ideas growing from its inception at District Hall and then through conversation and networking at Venture Cafe, then into the halls of CIC, where we do have that 60,000 square feet of everything from a co-working desk, a hot desk in our broader co-working space to private office suites that are pretty sizable with their own little on suites for private offices or an executive presence or a heads down working space for your team. But fully half of our square footage in our space, Lori, is actually shared or common space, not just the hallways. It's the printer stations, the conference rooms, the phone booths and the event space. And And the snacks. And the snacks. Don't forget the the snacks. snacks, Lori. The snacks. Ever since we've gone or ever since we've made an effort to reduce our touch points, we've had to retool our snacks. We're back in business with coffee. We've definitely got water and we have an evolving snack offering that we're hoping we'll start pivoting back toward local very soon. We had such a good rapport with our colleagues at, at Hope in Maine for a while, bringing local vendors in. And now we need everything that is individually packaged um, to help in, in our broader pandemic response effort. So all of those opportunities to come together, like in places um, like our kitchens, and we have a beautiful kitchen on every floor. It's a very attractive destination. The intention is to bring creative and innovative and entrepreneurial people together so that they can share ideas, they can grow ideas. And that's inspired by our mission, which is to have entrepreneurs fix the world through innovation. What, um, what, who is the target audience and what would be you know, a rough guesstimate of the existing demographic profile of your tenants from an industry perspective. Yeah, I would say I've been giving this a lot of thought and to go back to your historical illusion about what Providence looked like, I would say what's really interesting by industry is that we're still paying tribute to some of Rhode Island's historic strengths. For example, we actually have a large cluster of companies that operate in and or around the offshore wind space. 
you can't beat Rhode Island's geographic advantage relative to the distance from the staging areas for the first offshore wind demonstration project in the country. And the fact that we offer flexible terms, Lori, meaning you don't sign a long-term lease, we operate on 30-day agreements, meaning every 30 days you can right-size or scale up depending on your business's needs. For those companies who want a footprint here, proximate to this evolving wind industry energy, they can take a co-working desk and then they can grow their presence as the federal regulatory regime changes or as the opportunity for their business evolves. So we've had companies who have done that. They have started with smaller presences here and they have in some instances more than doubled their size since we opened our doors in August. So I think by industry, we've got great representation in offshore wind and we have a bunch of other really exciting um, fast growth companies, including software companies, because they cite CIC as the best place to attract and retain the top tier talent that they need to be successful. So it's really more about finding companies who are thriving on flexibility or who are thriving on uh, talent attraction and retention and taking the headache away from them. They don't need to worry about their operational infrastructure. Our team takes care of that. We provide mail. We make sure the space looks great. We help you book conference rooms. We are here to support as an extension of their team so they can focus on what they need to do best. So the um, so we have software um, as an industry that's mm -hmm. very well um, uh, populated at CIC. Yeah. And then we have offshore wind and those in the supply chain. Naturally, everybody wants to get close to Orsted, yes. which is leading the offshore wind project in Narragansett Bay, formerly Deepwater Wind, um, for those uh, folks that might remember Deepwater instead. So um, what are some of the other industry sectors that you are targeting? Rhode Island has such a strong heritage, heritage in design as well, Lori. And while there may not be a proliferation of designers here at the moment, we actually supported the Design by Rhode Island Design Catalyst program by offering to host their participants in our space um, for the duration of their program. So it was a space for them to come in and meet with their mentors, or if their particular medium allowed, they could come here and actually work on their projects. We see a large influence of design irrespective of the industry. So a lot of people who report uh, design thinking or uh, intuiting design thinking as part of what they do. Um, and I would say another dimension of what we're seeing are a lot of social impact organizations. And in fact, one of those social impact organizations is one that has grown uh, in our space over time, probably a reflection of um, the current dialogue around social justice and issues of equity. Um, I had a chance to visit uh, the CIC complex in Cambridge, which was the original Cambridge Innovation Center, right in Kendall Square, and it was started um, by MIT and um, a group of the entrepreneurs um, and venture capitalists and angel funders, etc., that were prevalent in that area. So um, the the inspiration for it um, started right in Cambridge, and then the um, the market for it or the desire for it and the real estate for it um, really spread out not just in New England but all across the world so can you tell us a little bit about CIC globally and its footprint uh, around the world absolutely thanks Lori yeah it's incredibly exciting to say that I've already had to edit my narrative around CIC and Providence because Lori even when I saw you most recently in February or March in the space, I could say that we were the seventh in the newest Cambridge Innovation Center site. That's no longer true. We are still the seventh, but we've welcomed an eighth site online uh, just last month in Warsaw. So to your point, CIC did begin in Kendall Square 20 years ago. Founder Tim Rowe is still um, the visionary leader of the organization. He was actually in town yesterday because he's still so innovative and entrepreneurially minded that we are working on a new offshoot of CIC that I'd love to share with you and, and the listeners today. Um, but we are, yeah, the seventh location from Cambridge. They spread out to Boston, just over the river. And as a native Rhode Islander, I had to learn that Cambridge and Boston are actually two very distinct places. <laughs> and what's fascinating other side that, of the bridge. Other side of the bridge, other side of the river. What's fascinating about that as a Rhode Islander, Lori, is when I was conducting my training almost two years ago now, it would take almost as long sometimes to go from the Boston CIC site to the Cambridge CIC site as it did to get to Boston in the first place from Providence. 
So Rhode Island, when it's convenient for us, can really be an extension of those Massachusetts sites, even though we have definitely our own flavor and a Rhode Island accent to what we do here. After the Massachusetts campuses, um, St. Louis was the next to open. And that started a tradition of operating in concert with Wexford Science and Technology, who is actually the building owner and asset manager here in Providence as well. Wexford, which is owned by Ventas, um, tends to find that these kinds of buildings work really well in cities that have a preponderance of um, academic institutions and especially academic medical centers. So you won't be surprised here that St. Louis with the presence of Washington University, St. Louis and others has found great success as part of the cortex development there. There are actually three CIC sites in St. Louis. Um, the next two sites to open would be um, Philadelphia and, or Miami and Philadelphia. Uh, Miami around the University of Miami and a hospital down there, and then Philadelphia um, in concert with the other academic institutions and the hospitals right in the vicinity. Um, Rotterdam is another CIC site and now Warsaw adding to the European contingent there. And we're really expectant for Tokyo to open in early fall of this year. And what it means to Rhode Islanders, Lori, is that you have access physically to all of these sites. When you are a member of CIC Providence, you can take a meeting in Boston. You can meet a venture capitalist in Cambridge. Um, we can make arrangements if you tend to spend some time in Miami in the winter uh, to have your CIC membership be able to apply to our sites there. It also means during this period where individuals might be more reluctant to travel that you still have access to this virtual network. We have a platform that allows our clients to reach out to other clients within our broader network to either gain access to resources or mentorship or new business opportunities. And our team is here to help support those connections and see them through. So is the, uh, is the membership um, strictly based on whether or not you have real estate or you've, you've taken out a, um, you know, a real estate location within CIC or is membership something that anyone can tap into based on desire and also the ability to pay the membership fee. So how does that work? Exactly, Lori. So membership means occupancy in this instance. When you have a membership to CIC, and we tend to say our clients are our members because you're really belonging to a community and you're truly not tethered to a particular space because you may decide that you'd like to move locations within CIC. And that gives individuals the flexibility to try us out and then to decide a configuration that works best for them. So yeah, our memberships begin with those individual co-working desks, those hot desks in our co-working center, which is on our third floor. And those desks are a very popular opportunity for people who might be a sole proprietor to have a dedicated mailing address, a place to put their heads down and work outside of the home, an opportunity to exchange ideas with others who are part of the co-working the co-working group there. Um, and we find that people have made really wonderful connections and really fruitful connections working out of our co-working center. And even though you're in that broader co-working space, you still have access to all of our amenities, the conference rooms to take meetings, the phone booth to take private calls, the game room if you want to unwind, and access to all of our community events, et cetera. Then from there, you could consider moving into a small private office and then the, op uh, the offerings extend. And don't forget the snacks. <laughs> So um, let me just ask you about the um, what the I know we're talking about, a, you know, a continuum of um, pricing opportunities yeah. and price points. And, you know, it, it could be uh, perhaps a phone book, a phone booth size, uh, literally phone booth size office space yeah. um, all up into, you know, modular offices that can flex and grow and contract. Um, as business conditions warrant it. So roughly on the continuum, what would you say the price variation is? It truly depends on how you use the space, Lori. And in fact, we are open to having conversations that acknowledge that the way teams work are different now. So traditionally, we would have said this office, in fact, the office I'm sitting in now, it's got a beautiful windowed view going north. I can see the hotel construction and the new Garrity parking garage. Um, this office is meant to accommodate up to four or five users, and the price would be a function of that volume of users. However, we recognize now that individuals might say, I have a team of 10, but I really only expect five individuals to be here at a time. So we can talk about a different kind of pricing that allows teams 
the flexibility to expose their colleagues to each other and the ideas and the importance of being together in a way that feels safe or appropriate or comfortable for them um, without bringing back an entire team at the same time. So that allows the companies to control for cost in a very predictable fashion. It allows to control to a certain extent, at least the level of exposure for colleagues. And it allows the flexibility for some of those colleagues who might be wondering how they're going to manage um, online education for their children, for example. But to answer your question, our co-working desks, which is sort of the, the entryway to our CIC community, are $300 a month. Your all-in cost of occupancy. Incredibly reasonable and just such a great resource. What percentage exactly. or how? Yeah, how has the um, how has the COVID nineteen situation impacted people's desire to go into a by definition co working space? How has the atmosphere changed over the last couple of months prior to COVID? Yeah, great question. Um, so we opened our doors. We're celebrating, actually, this is very timely. We're celebrating our one year anniversary last week. So last week, one year wow, ago. Has it been a, a year already? Holy smokes, we right? Opened our doors, absolutely. Sure. And our momentum was discernible, um, especially over the, the last one or two months prior to reducing our operations because of COVID. Um, we had gotten to the point where the energy and the participation and the occupancy was starting to feel like a more mature CIC site that you might find in Boston or Cambridge. In fact, Lori, we had an event that was at the end of February with our partners at Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses asking um, the entrepreneurs and the business owners if they would like to table at, at CIC Providence to show them our space and also to allow our members the opportunity to meet some of those entrepreneurs who might just be in an intersecting or peripheral network who they might not have gotten a chance to know previously because we're trying to bring this really tiny community even closer together. And we had dozens and dozens of people, and it was catered by a local vendor who had gone through the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. And we had our members and the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Biz alums speak about what they're doing and, and how important this community was to them. And that felt like the moment where we recognized that we had become this nucleus or this hub of activity that felt like it would become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then two months later, two weeks later, we we closed our doors um, due to the pandemic. However, we were always in some baseline. Say it again, Lori. Temporarily. Temporarily, exactly right. So we always had a baseline um, operational capacity because we actually provide an essential service to some of our clients, which is mail. And if you conduct your payroll via mail, you need access to that mail service. So we had a very thin trickle of clients who still came through the space pretty consistently in order just to make sure that they could keep up with their administrative backlog. So we did have that level of participation. We reopened, albeit in a reduced fashion, May 11th. So we've been back in the space since May 11th. And I would say this month, August, we've started to see an uptick in the regularity and the frequency of people coming through. And actually we've had some individuals now host socially distanced events again whether they're trainings or their uh, board meetings for their specific companies. And they've taken advantage of our new terrace on the third floor, which is open and tons of fresh air and a great opportunity for people to escape mm -hmm. uh, the heat or the conditions of being inside. Yeah. As it relates to the commitment of our clients, Lori, we're so grateful. We had only been around for about nine months when the pandemic transpired. And still, we saw the lion's share of our clients decide to invest with CIC, to remain affiliated with CIC Providence. And we're coming out the other side. Our revenue has recovered. We are eager to see companies that are taking advantage of our flexible model. Our pipeline is keeping us busy. So we're really grateful to report that we've got plenty of tours and we're starting to see that increase. What we want to see, though, are more people who feel comfortable using the space. Sure. And what we've done in terms of our pandemic response, I think our clients are really receptive to. We have one of the best air filtration systems around. We have made it virtually a touch-free environment for clients from their arrival to their private office. We are regularly demonstrating at least the safety around um, wearing face coverings. And you need to do that in all of the public and shared spaces. 
and our clients seem really grateful for our very proactive and early and consistent approach to well-being. That's great news. So Rebecca, a few minutes ago, you said you were going to tease us a little bit and uh, discuss or announce a new offshoot uh, CIC Providence. So what is it? Perfect segue, Lori. Thank you. So this is an initiative that's actually happening, uh, I'll say centrally, because it's only among our domestic United States sites, not our global sites. But CIC is actually in the process of launching a new business called CIC Health. The idea, Lori, is to provide as many layers of protection and appropriate layers of coverage for our clients as possible to support their safe return to work. CIC Health is actually the conduit in concert with our partners at the Broad Institute and medical professionals for assurance testing at our sites. So here at CIC Providence, we're starting with just our team. We want to get it right. It's too important a uh, process, you know, dealing with people's health and well-being. So we're starting with our team and we're going to be tested weekly. And then at other sites, we're already starting to extend it to CIC clients. So if you have a membership with CIC, we have special arrangements where your team can conduct assurance testing on a regular basis. And then ultimately, if this proves successful, we would love to be able to extend it to the broader community irrespective of your affiliation with CIC. So institutions, organizations, corporations, friends and family, if this works, this becomes a mechanism to support the testing infrastructure that other parties are bringing to bear. The difference being, Lori, we hope that you receive your test results in advance of your decision to return the work to work the next day. That's the okay, key so, to the efficacy yeah. of our testing. And okay, here so in Rhode Island, that's that's the big uh, that's the big limiting factor now. Exactly. Like you know, the timing of getting your test results back. Exactly right. And this governor's administration has just done an enormous job. The lift to operationalize the testing infrastructure in this state and the success despite the tragedy has been really remarkable. And I, I, I know most people can't say enough good things about the way Governor Raimondo and her team has handled this. Um, and Commerce Secretary Stephen Pryor has been right there in supporting CIC and all of the other businesses to make sure we have what we need. But there is a gap. Um, there is the gap for sort of a retail front door to testing, especially for people who don't make the grade in other categories that are being advocated for for testing. If you're asymptomatic, if you're not necessarily engaging with the public, um, if you're a person who doesn't come into the office all the time, if you still have a need and a desire and your company wants to support that and you're a member of CIC, we're trying to get to a place where we can offer that for our clients. So it's starting really in Boston and Cambridge and then we're right down the road. So yeah. uh, stand by for more on that. How is it that you are able to solve for that limiting factor of rapid testing and rapid results getting? Again, I have to point to our leader, Tim Rowe, who um, has never stopped being an innovator and never stopped disrupting the market. You mentioned, Lori, that when he founded CIC, it was in concert with a broader community from MIT. He has maintained those connections and is, in fact, um, a, a significant figure in Kendall Square still. And the Broad Institute, which is conducting our uh, actual test processing, is actually a collaboration between the uh, MIT and Harvard. So the connections to the academic institutions nearby and our ability to work with the Broad Institute is the reason why we can offer the testing uh, with such a rapid turnaround. So Broad as in B-R-O-D-E? It's actually B-R-O-A-D. I had been calling them the Broad Institute until someone told me otherwise. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Well, that's really exciting. Yeah. And, you know, once you're an innovator and you have that, instinct really um, enmeshed in your in your DNA and your heart and your soul you uh, you know you see a problem and you say okay you know there's a way that um, what can we do to fix it what can we do to bring a problem uh, to a bunch of people's attention and then find a way to, to solve it and to be able to scale it so that okay. is really interesting when do you think um, the project will be available in Providence we actually are starting this week with testing our team, Lori. So I think we just need to see the process work and make sure there aren't any kinks that our clients would experience because that's our whole job is making 
um, the work experience as easy and productive as possible for our clients, then we can make it um, offered more broadly to them and then hopefully extend in a really timely fashion to the broader community. If you're just joining us, we are speaking with Rebecca Weber, who is the general manager of CIC Providence, which is the Cambridge Innovation Center. We're talking about all things entrepreneurship and innovation related, and she just shared some really exciting news and broke some news here on Chamber TV about the ability of CIC all across the platform to solve for this problem of rapid testing of uh, employees so that they can feel comfortable um, returning to work. Tell us a little bit about how um, the testing will be carried out. Will, um, you know, when people enter the facility, um, taken to a, to a separate area, will there be some kind of like healthcare um, scenario that plays out and how does that actually, um, you know, how would, how would the flow of that work? Sure. Well, fortunately, we can report from experience because we saw a dry run conducted today because, again, you just have to take this so seriously, Lori, when you think about the ability to impact someone's health and well-being. So we have um, a test that we are using from the Broad Institute, and that test requires a nasal swab. The test will be conducted at least while the weather is conducive to it outdoors because the free flow of air is uh, most conducive to a healthy environment. And the test will be facilitated by a medical professional. And then we are able to uh, courier those tests up to Cambridge for the Broad Institute's evaluation. And then individuals who have access via an online portal to the confidential information will receive their test results, hopefully in a fashion that gives them the ability to feel um, as comfortable as possible about re-entering the office. The testing is is really a snapshot in time, though. So how do you um, how do you continue to provide that reassurance to your member that today they're negative, um, but what about next week or two weeks from now? How Absolutely. does you can you can do it as many times as you, you feel as though you would like to have the testing? Well, that'll depend on the client's preference, of course. Um, the, the client can decide to conduct the testing. We will make it available once it happens, Monday through Friday. So they will have the ability to do that if they're so inclined. Um, of co course, there are resources that are necessary in order to make that possible. Um, it, it is a service that, um, like I said, needs to be taken very seriously. So we have read or our leadership has communicated some research, Lori, that suggests that the gold standard in testing seems to be every three days. Every three days gives you the best ability to find people at points that would prevent maximum contagion. And of course, I'm not a medical professional and will not weigh in on, on any of the best practices in that capacity, but that's what we're understanding to be true. I think one or more major institutions are interested in pursuing that every three day um, uh, policy. I think Harvard might be among them for the people who are coming back to campus. Um, for the time being, as I mentioned, we're testing our staff weekly and we feel confident that that will be just another tool in our toolkit around the insurance. So every day when you come in, you're responsible for responding to your personal self-assessment link that CIC has provided. And that's meant to be one of the many um, dating factors to determine your best judgment in coming to work that day. Once you get in the space, we ask everybody to wear masks in the common areas. We make it as touch-free as possible. And then adding testing to this will hopefully be the impetus for more individuals to feel comfortable coming back to work. Who would have guessed a year ago that part of your membership uh, benefits and features would include rapid testing for the virus that we're in the pandemic? Sure. Who would have known that that's a benefit of membership? But um, great to know, great to learn about, and um, it's wonderful that you're solving a problem that is such a such a concern on everybody's minds. And can you address the um, the notion of the efficacy of the test and false positives, false negatives? Um, I'd have to leave that to professionals, Glory. I'm under the impression that this test is among the best of the best, but um, I I don't have the the sophistication to to evaluate the test itself. Um, but I just have to give so much credit to our team in Cambridge and Boston who made this possible, who are working, as you said, in a business that feels like quite a departure from our core competency, this co-working space, but at the same time embodies a lot of the same characteristics, Lori, of finding ways to promote 
access, especially for small and growing companies, to the amenities of a larger organization. And whether it's granting access to incredible, flexible workspace, or it's granting access to um, the programming that we offer, or it's granting access to the testing, this is another way that we're helping support innovators and entrepreneurs um, on their path to solving the world's challenges. Before I let you go, um, there was one aspect of your portfolio of services and products that we didn't touch on, so I want to do it just you sure. know, quickly, and then I will let you get back to your day. But talk a little bit about the educational programming that Absolutely. goes along with membership, because that's a significant uh, component as well and very much uh, something that's in demand. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, and, and certainly um, to the core, our community is so friendly and outreach is so prominent that we find that it can happen at a very informal level. There are a lot of conversations that happen around the coffee machine that end up being quite uh, educational, I think, for all parties involved. So it's wonderful to see um, the ability to manifest the value of community in a really informal setting. As for the educational um, programs that we offer in a more formal setting, we're excited to get back to things that would include, um, for example, refining your pitch deck or um, the opportunity to meet and talk with interested investors, the opportunity to meet and speak with interested mentors, and the ability to extend those resources in a lunch and learn setting or in a happy hour setting. The more formalized programming that I think um, warrants mention is what's happening at Venture Cafe. Venture Cafe every Thursday has either industry or thematic specific events that are certainly worth checking out. Right now, as I mentioned, they're exclusively virtual, but their digital content is really cool. And a lot of it is very much evergreen, but very topical. There's a lot around the ways that businesses are finding their way to resilience and a lot about different industries that are coping in ways that um, are both interesting and surprising around the pandemic response. So I have to give a lot of credit to Venture Cafe, which does offer um, that really robust programming on a, a weekly basis. That's great. So we, uh, we value our relationship with you, Rebecca, and with all of your colleagues at Venture Cafe, CIC. Uh, the whole community has done such a remarkable job elevating the entrepreneurial mindset of our community and you know really sharpening um, the tools in the toolbox and being able to point to the distinct attributes of doing business in Rhode Island as an entrepreneur who is looking for resources, funding, mentors, advocates, um, talent, students, access to world-class businesses, hospitals, uh, universities, other nonprofit organizations. So we are so thrilled to have you here. We are so proud of the work that you are doing, Rebecca. You are a force of nature, and we at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce are really fortunate to uh, to call you a friend and a partner and a champion, and we love everything you're doing. Uh, any last words that you'd like to uh, share with our viewers today? We're just grateful to be part of this ecosystem. We don't do it alone. We've got so many partners in the Greater Providence Chamber among them. So we're grateful for the support. We invite businesses who wonder if CIC might be the right fit for them to reach out and contact us. Our phone number and contact information is on the website. And thank you, Lori, and your team for your leadership and for keeping the momentum up in the business community in a time when it's otherwise really easy to get down. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And uh, I look forward to the day when we can all convene uh, in a way that uh, is not socially distanced. But in the meantime, I hope to be able to visit you and to maybe spend a few minutes outside on your new terrace and uh, talk about all the wonderful things that you are doing uh, in the Innovation District. So thank you for your time today. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate it. And folks, if you have any questions, do feel free to reach out to Rebecca. Follow her on social media. What are your uh, Twitter handles um, and various other social media contact profiles, Rebecca? We are at CIC Providence, and I am the anti-millennial as it relates to knowing how to engage with that. So I am so happy to provide my email address. Um, it is Weber, W-E-B-B-E-R, at CIC.com. That's the best way to reach me. Okay, so follow her, email her, be in contact with her. 
ring her bell, go see her, but don't forget your face covering. And thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lori.